We pray to you now as we have just sung our good, our good Father. You are the only good one in this world. You're the source of good. You're the definition of good. You're the giver of good. And you're the hope of all things good. And so I pray that as we come together this morning as a church body in the midst of a cruel and perversive world, as your Bible calls it, that we may remember your goodness, that who you are. May we remember the hope that you have given us Christians of a future eternal life with you, our good Father. May you remind us that you are our Father. If we are Christians, when you are our Heavenly Father, you have adopted us into your family. And you're not a derelict Father. You're not an absent Father. You're one that is intimately acquainted with all our ways, who loves us, cares for us, comforts us, as your word says. And you'll take and you're whom, whom we'll be with forever. But now as we live in this cruel and perversive world uh, with our sin-cursed bodies in this sin-cursed world, sometimes we may forget your goodness. We may forget who you are. But I pray in those moments you may drive us to the word. You may drive us to prayer. To drive us to church so we can encourage each other and remind each other of your goodness as we see in your word. And specifically of your grace, as we shall learn about today. We have learned about your grace previously, but now we're going to see how it's applied to us. And what you've done for us. And how you've saved us by your grace alone. Even though we were and are undeserving of any drop of goodness from you. Yet you have lavished upon us eternal life. You've given us salvation all through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's to Him we want to glorify this morning. It's to you we want to glorify this morning. It's to your Spirit we want to glorify this morning. May you be magnified today through who you are, based on an accurate theological understanding of your grace as we see in your word. May you enlighten all of us today, open our eyes and open our hearts to understand and apply your truth. So not only will you be glorified, but, they, but that there may be changed lives this morning. We pray for your exaltation this morning. Help me to be the means of praising you through the preaching of your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I've got a big name for you. Well, Desiderius Erasmus Rotorodamus, or otherwise known as Erasmus, he was a leading religious Roman Catholic figure during the 15th and the 16th centuries. And this man, Erasmus, as I'm going to call him, he was committed to reforming the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Erasmus was an avid scholar. During his time, you would not find many people smarter than him. He was trained at the University of Paris and an expert in Greek and Latin. And Erasmus was most well known for his work on the Greek New Testament and his updating of the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was the, the Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, Erasmus was a powerhouse scholar for the RCC. <coughs> Ironically, it was his Greek New Testament that he put together that inspired and enabled Martin Luther to look to what the original meaning of the Bible, Bible was rather than the Latin rendering from the Latin Vulgate. So whilst Erasmus did much for the Roman Catholic Church, he was also used by God in spite of his intentions, but he was used by God to spur on the Reformation. The Reformation, as we have been learning over these coming weeks, was a time primarily in the 15th century whereby men and women went back to the Bible and championed various doctrines 
specifically the five solas we've been going through. So this was Erasmus. He was used by God here, and even though he might not have wanted it to be used that way. But now, despite translating the Bible for himself, Erasmus remained a committed Roman Catholic all of his life. However, he was about to enter the arena of theology when the Vatican wanted to use him to debate Martin Luther. So in September 1524, Erasmus was pressurized by Rome to pen an attack on Martin Luther's theology. In other words, they said to him in, in, in contemporary ways, you are the smart scholar, and by the way, you've made this mess, so go and fix it. Go clean it up. Thus, seven years after Luther penned those 95 theses, his, his indictments against the, mainly the sale of indulgences that we learned two weeks ago, seven years after that, Erasmus wrote a book called The Diatribe Concerning Free Will. Erasmus decided to attack Luther's theology, not on the sale of indulgences, but not on the issue of authority, but Erasmus decided to attack Luther on the issue of man's free will in his or her salvation, to which Luther was glad. He was glad to join this conversation, and he even thanked Erasmus for bringing this debate to him, because Luther believed that dealing with this issue was pivotal. He believed that this issue got to the crux of the debates between the Reformers and the Roman Catholic Church because it dealt with salvation, how one becomes right with God, how you become a Christian, how you become a true believer in Christ. For Rome, on the one hand, believed that salvation comes from man cooperating with God, Whilst Luther and the other reformers argued that no, it's God alone who operates in our salvation. Thus, in Erasmus' work, he argued that although the fall of man in Genesis 3, this is Erasmus' argument, he said, yes, man fell in Genesis 3, and this fall negatively affected our, our, our human will, but he said it didn't destroy it. His argument was that human beings, although weakened by sin, are still able to do good deeds by their own free will. But not only are they able to do good deeds by their free will, but because they have an essence of goodness in them, they can cooperate with God's grace to achieve their salvation. Now Erasmus agreed. He said, yes, grace is necessary for salvation. He still agreed God is sovereign. However, his argument was that man must work together with God to be saved. This is called a synergistic, a synergistic theology. You, man is going to work together with God. Erasmus argued that if God gave mankind commands, if he gave mankind laws and precepts and threats in the Bible, then by default mankind must be able to have the free will or the moral ability to obey them. He wrote this, All these precepts in the Bible are useless if nothing is attributed to the human will. If it is not in the power of every man to keep what is commanded, all the exhortations of Scripture are of necessity useless. Thus Erasmus argued against the traditional Reformed view that man is saved by grace alone. Erasmus and the Vatican instead argued that man is that whilst grace saves man, their argument is that grace alone doesn't save him. Instead, since man has still a free will, he can and he must cooperate with God's grace. Their view is that grace is a power that assists human responses, and thus grace is communicated to man through the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. That he argued this grace is resistible and it can be lost when you commit a mortal sin. But then this grace can be restored many times through the sacrament of penance. Thus, man needs grace, but grace also needs man. The two work hand in hand in their theology. Basically, Erasmus' view and the Roman Catholic view, even today, is that sin has not completely destroyed man's ability 
to choose God, salvation is thus the synergistic or dual effort between the free will of man and the grace of God. And so once this book was written, Rome thought they had won. They had won the battle against this heretic Martin Luther. That they thought that Erasmus had silenced him once and for all. For how could Luther argue against such a smart man and such a great work? However, however, one year later, Luther wrote his own book in response to this book. He wrote a book, maybe you've heard of it, entitled The Bondage of the Will. It was in this book, where, which is probably his most theological work, in which he argued that mankind is unable to save himself. Mankind is unable to cooperate with God's grace. Mankind is unable to come to God, God on his own because his will is in bondage to sin. Man is not free since man is a slave to sin. And thus would not on his own willpower or free will come to God. That is why God must save by his grace and by his grace alone. God must regenerate man by his grace and even give man the gift of faith to save him. The bottom line is this in his argument. Man is not the initiator in salvation. God is because God saves us by his grace alone. Luther argued that just because God gave man commands, that does not mean man has the ability to obey them. In fact, he argued the commands God gave us, their purpose was to show us our inability to obey God. For just as Romans 3.20 says that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And in Galatians, it teaches us that the law is our tutor to lead us to Christ. He argued that the commands are given to mankind to show him he needs Jesus. He needs God. He needs grace. He can't do it himself. Thus Luther championed the biblical doctrine that man is saved by grace alone. He is not saved by grace and our efforts. Man is not saved by grace and penance or grace and the mass or grace and anything. He is saved by grace and by grace alone. Salvation comes from God and from God alone. A man is not the initiator in salvation, but he is the recipient of it. A doctrine, like I said, it was and is still rejected by the RCC. But it's a doctrine that is not only rejected by Rome, but it's very undermined by many Protestant churches even today. For whilst many Protestant churches would agree mankind is saved by grace and not by works, but they would still, what they'll do, either in theory or in practice, still maintain or teach that man in some way still participates or he cooperates with God in salvation. He in some way can save himself, even if it's just a small part. And so the question we must answer this morning, or at least ask and then answer, is this, is man's salvation entirely a work of God, or is it a cooperative effort between God and man? And so it's a question I wish to help answer you this morning. And so what we've been doing is that we are busy, busy going through the five solas of the Reformation. This is our third sermon in this. In our first week, we looked at the history behind the Reformation. What actually took place in the 16th century that inspired certain people like Martin Luther and others to go back to the Bible and see what God has to say about himself and salvation. Then last week we looked at the first sola, the fundamental one, the foundational one, that we that is that is sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. We learned that the Christian is someone who sees the Bible as the final authority in all matters in life. The Christian is someone who looks to God's Word and God's Word alone to determine what is truth, what is practice. Yes, human authorities are helpful sometimes, but as we learned, they are only helpful insofar as they accord with the Word of God. We learned that God's Word is pivotal, is essential, and it trumps anything man can say that might supersede it or be equal to it. 
The Christian, we learned, must be a man or woman of the book. The Christian's constant refrain should be, what does the Bible say about this issue? What do the scriptures say? The Christian, we learned, must be someone who, according to 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, must take every thought captive to Christ. Everything we think about, everything we do, must be filtered through the words of Jesus Christ. Because He is God and He knows more than us. The Christian must be one whose theology is derived from the Bible, whose worldview is shaped by the Bible, whose practice is molded by the Bible. The Christian must be someone who aims to be like the one Puritan John Bunyan, the man who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, whom it was said if you cut him, he would bleed the Bible. And that was sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. That's what we learned last week. And now that we have established that doctrine, we can look to the other solas, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus, and sola dea gloria. We say by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Now that we have the scripture as our foundation, we can begin to look at the rest. And today we're going to look at the next one, sola gratia, which is a Latin phrase that we are saved by grace alone. Not that man is saved uh, with grace, but by grace alone. That God saves man purely on the basis of his grace. Man is not saved by what he does, who he is, how smart he is, what uh, God saw and put, what potential God might have seen in this person. No, God saves by his grace. And so I'm going to be arguing that man does not work with God in his salvation, but that God saves us by His grace and His grace alone. And as we look at this, we are obviously going to encounter some controversial issues, issues that relate to this doctrine, such as predestination, election, and free will. For your view on sola gratia, grace alone, will impact what you believe about these issues. And so what I've done this morning is that I have divided, like last week, this sola into two different parts. Just like last week. We're going to look at two parts that argue that man is saved by grace alone. The first part, we're going to, we're going to simply look at arguments for grace alone or sola gratia. And the second part is simply arguments that defend sola gratia or grace alone. We have arguments for it and arguments that defend it from objectors, from objections. So let's begin with the first part. We're going to begin to argue for this doctrine. Because as we looked at last week, if it's not from the Bible, we should not believe it. But if it is, we should embrace it and live by it. And so we're going to begin with the first part, arguments for solo gratia, or grace alone. And the way in which I'm going to be arguing for this doctrine will again be pretty similar to what I did last week. I'm going to give you two arguments, two overview arguments of why grace alone must be believed if you're a Christian. And it's simply based on the nature of God himself and the nature of man. The nature of God himself and the nature of man. And by looking at these two natures, we're going to come to the inevitable conclusion that man is saved not just by grace, but by grace alone. And it must be stressed that this solar, this doctrine, is more concerned or emphasizes more God's role in our salvation. And next week when we look at faith alone, that doctrine is going to emphasize more of man's responsibility. And whilst there are certain overlaps, grace is primarily about God and faith is primarily about man. And so, and, but once we've established that we are saved by grace alone, only then can we understand why man is saved by faith alone and not by works. So the first argument why we believe in sola gratia, that man is saved by grace alone, is based on the nature of God, who he is. Several weeks ago, we learned about a man called A.W. Tozer, and if you remember, it was him who said that what you believe about God and who He is will, will impact everything else in your life. And that's so true, and that is why we must start here, with God. 
This doctrine is demanded because of who God is. Man is saved by grace alone because of the nature of God, because of who he is, his characteristics, his attributes, his perfections. Thus, what about God, we must ask? What about God, what about his nature affects why you and I are saved by grace alone? And so the most obvious place to start will be to look at the grace of God himself. If God is gracious, then that is why he saved us by grace. And the scriptures are abundantly clear that God is gracious. I don't think I have to make a big argument to prove to you that God is gracious. Not only I am, am I sure that you've read it in the Bible yourself, but I'm sure you've also experienced his grace in your life. But the Bible does say that God is gracious. He, he calls himself gracious in Exodus chapter 22 verse 27. He is called gracious by his followers in Genesis 43 verse 29. But not only does he himself call himself gracious, not only do his followers call him gracious, but as Psalm 84 verse 11 says, he also does gracious acts. It says, the Lord gives us grace. God is gracious. That's who he is. That's what he does. That's what we see in him. God delights in giving of himself to others. That is grace. Giving to others something they did not earn or deserve. If they earned it, and you gave them something because of what they did, then that wouldn't constitute grace because you gave them something because of what they did. They deserved it. They earned it. It's a wage. It's not a gift anymore. Grace is basically unmerited favor, giving to those who do not deserve it. And this grace is most notably seen in how God saves us. How God graciously gives us the gift of salvation when we did not deserve it. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 2 verse 8 about our salvation, he said, For by grace you have been saved, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And notice a man is saved by grace and not with grace. It is by grace. Man's salvation is not of himself. It is a gift from God. And it comes by his grace. God gives of himself to those who do not deserve him. If we cooperated in our salvation with God then we would be saved with grace and not by grace. But since we are saved by grace from a gracious God, we are saved by grace alone. It is entirely a sovereign work of God. God is the one who saves us. He is the one who does the work. God is a gracious God. But what are some other attributes or some other characteristics or other perfections that emphasize that we are saved by God's grace alone? That man is saved entirely by God's doing and not our own doing. Well, there are several attributes that highlight this. First, as we can put them together, God's sovereignty and his eternality. God's sover sovereignty refers to how he is in charge of everything, how he ordains everything, how he allows things, how he's in control of all things. Ephesians 1 verse 11, that he, all things work after the counsel of his word. Of his will. God is sovereign. But he's not only sovereign now. He's been eternally sovereign. God is eternal. The scriptures say he is the everlasting. The eternal one. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning there was already God there. He's eternal. And what that means is. He is not bound by time. The only being who is not bound by time. He created time. He is perfectly present in the past as he is in the present as he is in the future god is the god of the past he's the god of the present he's the god of the future at the same time he's eternal he's outside of time he's sovereignly outside of time and because he's sovereignly outside of time he not only works all things now he works all things in the past and the future isaiah chapter 46 verse 9 to 10 says of god Remember the former things long past, for I am God, 
and there is not an, there is not other, not another. I am God, and there is no one like me. There's no one like God. Why? What can God do? It says it right here, declaring the end, the end. So the end of the ages. When did He declare that? From the beginning. And from ancient things, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God not only knows the future, but He has established the future. He will accomplish what He wants to do. Job even recognizes, he said, No plan of yours, God, can be thwarted. And what that means with regards to us being saved by completely by God's doing and not our own, is that God knows who exactly will be saved. Because not only does He know the future, but He ordains the future. He's established the future. And that would include our salvation. Psalm 139 verse 16 says of God, And in your book, what was in this book? Were all written the days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them. Man's days, David's days in the psalm were already written down by God before he had lived them. Before he had lived them. Man's days are already pre-written down by God, ordained by God. Before man even experiences those days, God knows what will happen because God ordains what will happen. God is not a good guesser. God is not just this lucky God. God is not a really good event coordinator. He is the sovereign God who ordains all things before they happen. And what this means is, is that man can only be saved by God's grace alone simply by the fact that his salvation was already predetermined before he existed. Man is not saved by grace and his own doing because where was man when God planned or ordained his days? Man wasn't even alive. And then to boggle your mind even a bit more, let's add God's omniscience, how He knows all things, into the equation. How God never learns anything. That's God's omniscience. He never learns anything. He always knows everything. He knows how much there is to know. And that He knows it perfectly. God knows all things that will ever be known and ever can be known. He is the source of knowledge, the source of wisdom. 1 John 3 verse 20 simply says, God knows not some things, not most things, not just the present, but He knows all things. All things. Psalm 147 verse 5 says about God's understanding, it's infinite, not finite, not limited, not restricted, but without measure, infinite. His understanding is endless, it's boundless, unlimited. And so if you add God's omniscience, how He knows all things, with God's sovereignty, with His eternality, with God's grace and our salvation, you have to come to the conclusion that since God knows all things, and since God ordained all things, since He knows the future, there was never actually a time when God sat down and said, I'm going to save Bob on February 20th, 2022. There was never a time when God sat down and decided that. He always knew it. It was always the plan of God. Always written down. Never a time when it wasn't written down. Always ordained. Therefore, man cannot be a part of his own salvation. Man does not save himself simply by the fact that man was not there when God decided to save man by His grace. God had always planned to save man before man could even think, before he could do anything. And before you think that this was merely just for mankind in general, we're going to go through many different individuals in Scripture and see what the Scripture says about their, about their salvation. Think of how the Apostle Paul spoke of Jacob and Esau in Romans chapter 9. And in verse 11 he said this, For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so they're not born yet. So that God's purpose according to His choice would stand, not because of works, but because of Him who calls, God saved them. He hated Esau and Jacob He loved before they were born. We're not saved because of how smart we are, 
or how much potential God saw in us, not because of anything you had done, not because you're better than the person sitting next to you. No. You're saved entirely because God decided in eternity past to set His love and His grace upon you. Before you had done anything, before you were alive, God already decided to set His saving grace upon you. That is why man can only be saved by grace alone. Think of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is another man. According to Jeremiah 1 verse 5, God told Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, this is before he was anywhere in the, his mom's womb, he said, I knew you. I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I've appointed you a prophet to the nations. Before Jeremiah was born, God chose him, ordained him to the ministry. Think of John the Baptist. According to Luke 1 verse 8 to 17, he was chosen to be the forerunner of the Messiah before he was even born. Think of the Apostle Paul. He said in Galatians 1 verse 15 of his own salvation, he said, But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace. So when was Paul set apart and chosen by God to be saved by his grace? Before he was born. Think of Timothy, whom Paul said to him in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, that God saved them and called them, not according to our works, he said, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us, he says, in Christ Jesus from all eternity. When did God decide to save Paul and Timothy? By his grace, when did that happen? He said, from all eternity. And then before you think there are exceptions, listen to what Paul said in Ephesians 1 verse 4 about when God decided to save us by His grace. He said this, Ephesians 1 verse 4, Just as He chose us, so when did God choose us? In Him, when did it happen? Before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless. When did God decide to save you by His grace? Before the foundation of the world. Where were you when the world was formed? I wasn't there. I'm certain you weren't there either. We didn't exist. Thus, if you did not exist and God chose you before you existed, how can you be a co worker in your salvation? How can you cooperate with God's grace when He decided to save you before you were born? Then in Revelation 13, verse 8, the Apostle John, John spoke about. The future tribulation period, that terrible time in the future, those seven years of, of pain. And he said about the people who would worship the beast or the Antichrist. And who did John say will worship him? He said those whose name has not been written. That implies that those who will not worship the beast, their names are written down. These are the Christians who will not worship him. But when were these names written down? He said, since the foundation of the world, at the beginning of the world, God wrote down those who would be saved. And he specifically, Revelation, speaking about the end of our age. And my point is this, salvation has, since your salvation has been predetermined by God before you were born, you could not in any way co cooperate with God in your salvation. You're not saved with grace, you're saved by grace. And by grace alone. And then one more attribute of God I want to add into this um, whole spiel. One that highlights God's grace and our salvation. That we're saved by grace alone. That is God's jealousy. God's jealousy. So yes, God is a jealous God. We, we learned about that several months ago. In Exodus chapter 34 verse 14. The Israelites were told to not worship any other God. In Exodus 34 verse 14. But why? Why were they told not to worship any other God? Because the verse says, For the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. But what does it even mean? Well, if you remember, God's jealousy refers to how He zealously protects and avenges all that belongs to Him. God is jealous for all that belongs to Him, including His glory. 
And because he's also perfectly righteous, he's perfectly holy, perfectly good, he is perfectly righteously jealous for his glory. And it will not be given to anyone else. That is why man is saved by grace alone, because God is jealous for his own glory. He is zealous about receiving all the glory. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says this, I am the Lord, or better, I am Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. God will not give his glory to anyone else. And that is especially true in salvation. One of the main things, if not the main thing that God has done in this world, and that is coming to save us sinful beings, God is definitely not going to share his glory with us. Man is saved by grace alone because if man cooperated in his salvation, then man would deserve a little bit of the glory. But God said he's not going to share his glory with anyone. So why would God co-work with man when man wants to take his glory? Because not only will God not share his glory, man is not even worthy of being part of that glory. What did man even do to save himself? Why would God give man some glory when man was perfectly useless in salvation? Why would God co-work with man when man is a bad co-worker? There was a Puritan preacher, Jonathan Edwards, and he said, the only thing that you contributed to your salvation, do you want to contribute something? Yeah, you did contribute something. He said, you contributed your sin. Your sin. Only thing we contributed to our salvation, he said, was the sin that made our salvation necessary. The only part you played in your salvation was the fact that you sinned and thus needed to be saved. You did nothing positive in your salvation and thus deserved no glory, but God did everything and thus deserves all the glory. It was God who was the one who sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, and we were the ones who rebelled against God. It was God the Son who was the one who died on the cross. Why? Because He was dying for our sins. We were the sinners. It was God the Son who lived the perfect life because we lived the imperfect ones. It was God the Son was the one who was buried. He was the one who bore the wrath of God instead of us so we wouldn't have to receive it. It was God the Son who was the one who rose from the grave conquering death because we couldn't conquer it. It was God the Son who was the one who ascended into heaven as we were going to descend into hell. It was God the Spirit who was the one who began the church whereby we hated the things of God. It was God the Spirit who is the one who indwells us and sanctifies us whereas we are the ones who loved our flesh. God is the one who has given us eternal life. And God was, did all of that. And know what you did? You did everything bad. Everything bad. Thus we deserve nothing. We didn't even want salvation. We loved our sin. We hated God. And thus God deserves all the glory and rightly so. That is why we are saved by grace alone. That is why we do not work with God in our salvation. Simply because that would mean we would deserve a little bit of glory. And even if God did most of the work, just saying He did 90% and we did 10%, we would still deserve 10% of the, of the glory. And maybe every 10th song in, at church we could sing a, the praise to ourselves. Maybe every 10th week, instead of reading God's Word, we can read our Word. Maybe every 10th week, instead of preaching God's Word, we can preach our Word. Maybe every 10th day, we could give thanks to our own hard work rather than the work of God. But no. If God did everything, if God planned to save us by His grace and His grace alone, and if it's His grace that sustains us, and it's all His doing, His grace, His mercy, His love, we didn't save ourselves, God saved us, then we wouldn't want to take part and steal any of His glory. God's the one who chose us. Think about what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, verse 16. He said, you did not choose me. You didn't choose me. But I chose you. 
Next time you're tempted at thinking that you had a part in your salvation, remember what Jesus said. You did not choose me. I chose you. And so we've learned that the nature of God demands that we're saved by grace alone. But not only does the nature of God demand it, but so does the nature of man. And now we've spoken about this several times, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but it's necessary to include you. The great British preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, We declare on scriptural authority that the human will is so desperately set on mischief, so depraved, so inclined to everything that is evil, and so disinclined to everything that is good, that without the powerful, supernatural, irresistible influence of the Holy Spirit, no human will ever be constrained. And so what Spurgeon was saying was the same thing Luther was saying, was the same thing that we, I would argue that the scriptures were teaching. That mankind is in bondage to his sin. And because he's in bondage to his sin, he is unable to save himself. He needs God to save him. The slave cannot free himself. He needs God to free him. Man cannot cooperate with God in his salvation because man is a slave to his sin and thus not only does not want to save himself, he can't even save himself. He neither has the willpower nor the desire to save himself because he is in bondage, he is enslaved to sin. John 8, 34, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And as the Bible teaches, we're all, we've all committed sin. We've born in sin and we commit sin. And thus, we're a part of this. We're, a, well, at least the, the unbeliever was the slave of sin. Mankind is enslaved to his sin, is in bondage to it. Sin owns them. And it's a fitting description. Slaves are owned by their master. They're in bondage to their master. The master says, go left, you go left. He says, go right, you go right. And thus you cannot, and slaves cannot free themselves. No amount of education or money can change this condition of man. The world thinks that if you educate someone, he'll become a good person. If you give him more money, he'll become a good person. He might become better, maybe. It doesn't make him good. Why? Because he's still a slave of sin. Nothing man can do can free himself from his enslavement to sin. You think you have free will, but how can you be free if you're in bondage to your sin? You're not free. You have, you're in bondage to your sin. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 3 verse 10 to 11, There is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks for God. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says that our hearts are deceptively deceitful and sick. King Solomon, he said in 1 Kings 8, 46, there is none who does not sin. The bottom line is this, mankind is sinful, so sinful, so enslaved to his sin. Well, that means he's unable to save himself. But not only can he not save himself, man doesn't even want to do it. Man loves his sin. He doesn't want God. Romans 1 verse 18 is very influential in how we think of man. Romans 1 verse 18. Paul says that man, all men, know the truth of God. At least to some degree. All men, he says, know this. But he says they don't want the truth. Instead, he says mankind, what he does with the truth of God, he suppresses that truth in unrighteousness. In other words, man knows there's a God out there, or at least some uh, aspects of the God we serve. He knows there's a creator, but because he loves his sin, he will suppress that truth in his unrighteousness. Jesus said in John 3 verse 19 that man loves the darkness. He loves the darkness rather than the light. Therefore, if man is enslaved to sin, if man does not seek God, if man loves the darkness rather than the light, then the only way a sinner can be saved is if God supernaturally chooses to intervene and save him. 
God must do the work. Not some of the work, all the work. Man does not cooperate with God in salvation because man simply doesn't want to be saved. God is the one who must call mankind to himself. That's what Jesus said in John 6, 44. No one, no one. He said, this is Jesus. No one can come to me. You can't come to me. No one can come to me unless, so here's the exception, unless the Father who sent me draws him. You cannot come to Jesus unless God chooses to draw you to Jesus. And I'm just astounded. I've, I've been a Christian for many years now. I've been in ministry for many years now. And I'm astounded at how many Christians reject this teaching. They reject that God is sovereign in our salvation. And I just found it fascinating because they all agree. They believe in the sovereignty of God in creation. They pray to God for help. They pray to God to raise up leaders and to bring down bad leaders. They pray to God to influence governments. They pray to God to save someone. They submit to God's wisdom and knowledge. They believe not God knows the future. They believe that God can heal. They believe God is sovereign in so many areas except our salvation. Or as one author said, we yield to a sovereign will at every point. Yet we so desperately want to cling to the notion that we exercise our own free will to be saved. That we gave spiritual birth to ourselves. But it's not true. How can you give birth to yourself? To be born again means that someone else had to give birth to you. For not only is it inconsistent to believe and act like that, but it's simply unbiblical. Man is saved by grace alone. Salvation is entirely a work of God's grace, of God's hand, not of man. Martin Luther, he said, If grace depends on our cooperation, then it's no longer grace. Because then you deserve it. But as we learned earlier, as we heard earlier, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, Grace is a gift. It's a gift. Even faith is a gift. Before I close this point, I want to stress that this doesn't mean we... We are not responsible for placing our faith in Christ. The Bible teaches that God is both sovereign in our salvation and that man is responsible for placing his faith in Christ. However, as we shall learn next week, faith is the means of salvation, not the cause. Like I said earlier, grace alone emphasizes God's sovereign work in our salvation. And as we shall see next week, faith alone, or sola fide, is the doctrine that emphasizes our responsibility. We're called to place our faith in Christ. We're called to repent of our sins and, and follow Christ and trust in the Son of God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the Bible also teaches that God's sovereign hand is behind it all. That whilst man places his faith in God and repents of his sins before God, it is God who gives faith and repentance to man as a gift. And so next week we will focus... On that, we're going to focus on man's responsibility. But before we close, I want to deal with some objections and brief, with brief answers like we did last week. And so we're going to go to the second part, arguments defending sola gratia. And like I said, I'm going to do the same thing as last week. I'm going to present a common objection and give a simple answer. That's what I'm going to try to do. And so we're going to see arguments defending sola gratia. So let's give some several objections that you might hear. First big one, what about free will? What about free will? Does man thus have free will? If man cannot choose God, but God must choose him instead, then does that mean God overrides my will? Yes. God must override your will because your will is bent on sin. Not God. To have free will simply means to be unbiased and completely objective in everything you think, do, and act. To have free will means to be able to choose something without any influence. That's free will. If you were given two options, free will would imply that nothing would influence you in choosing A over B. But the reality is we are all under the influence of something when it comes to making decisions. Just think about this. If you went and got your favorite food and put it on this table, and then your least favorite food on that table, 
Which one would you pick to eat? Or at least which one would you want to pick to eat? You would pick your favorite food, more than likely. And then you must ask yourself this, why is this my favorite and this my least favorite? Because one tastes better. But what makes you believe one tastes better than the other one? Why do your taste buds prefer this food over the other? You don't know. You just like this one, you don't like this one. That's in your daily eating habits, you're influenced by something else. Even in your eating habits, you're not able to be 100% partial. And if you're not totally free in your thinking when it comes to your food, why do you think when it comes to something more important like your salvation, you're all of a sudden free to make an impartial decision? That's up to you. Now your love of sin compels you to not choose God. And dwelling love for sin has changed your capacity, influenced your capacity to choose God, to seek God. So God must seek you. God must choose you. He must, as First John 4 says, He loves us first. God must begin, as Philippians 1 verse 6 says, He begins the good work in you. Second objection you might hear. If God chooses who will be saved, then that seems unfair to those who are not chosen. If God chooses who shall be saved, it seems unfair to those who, will, who are not chosen. And there's irony in this question, because the objection proves what is taught. This objection to God's sovereignty, sovereignty in salvation actually proves it. How? Well, in Romans chapter 9, Paul, after discussing God's absolute freedom, freedom in whom he will save, after he argued for that he will save whoever he, whoever, whoever, whoever he wants, the Apostle Paul then anticipated an objection. In verse 19, Paul anticipated an objection, and he said this, You, so speaking to people who might object to him, you will say to me then, so as a result of this argument, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? In other words, the very same objection that people give today to this doctrine is actually found in the Bible. And what this means is that the objection proves that this is what the Bible teaches. And then Paul answers this unfair objection by simply saying this, On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use, and he says, another vessel for common use. Paul's answer is simply, God created you, and because he created you, he owns you, and thus he can do whatever he wants with you. He has a prerogative to do what he wants. And the reality is this, who is it actually unfair to? Who is salvation actually unfair to? Is it unfair that some get saved and others do not? Oh, we go back to the two natures we spoke of earlier. If God is perfectly good and all He does is perfectly good, then it cannot be unfair. God will only do that which is good. And if mankind is utterly sinful, and is naturally sinful, then mankind, no man deserves salvation. What is unfair is that God had to send His Son to die for mankind. To die for you. You did not want Jesus Yet, He still came to die for you. If it's unfair to anyone, it's unfair to God. You do not deserve salvation, yet God, in His grace, sent His Son to save you. Not because of what you have done. In fact, think about this. When, God, when Jesus came to the cross, God already knew every single sin that every mankind would do in the future. He knew every single sin that you would commit in your lives. And yet, knowing all of mankind's sins, their future sins, their current sins, their past sins, He still sent His Son. He still did it. It's not God's fault. It's man's fault. Man's the one who doesn't deserve salvation. Third objection. If God chooses who shall be saved, 
then what is the point of praying or evangelizing? If God chooses whom will be saved, then what's the point of us praying? What's the point of us evangelizing? Well, firstly, we know in Romans chapter 10, verse 1, the Apostle Paul, just after speaking of God's sovereignty, says he prays for salvation to his fellow people, for his fellow people. He still does it. In fact, the reason why he does it is because he knows God's sovereign. And we mustn't confuse the ends with the means. For not only does God ordain what's going to happen in the end, but he ordains the means, how to get there. And your prayers and your evangelizing are the means that God gets to the end, that God uses to achieve his purposes. If you, if you choose not to be involved, that's your sin, that's your fault, you chose to rebel, God will still achieve his purpose, but then you won't get, if you're a Christian, you won't get rewarded in heaven for being used by God. Our job is to be faithful. To be faithful. To do God's work, to pray, to evangelize. We don't know the future. We don't know what God's doing with everything. We just do what God's called us to do. And then because God is sovereign over all things, whatever happens, if we are faithful, that's what God desired and wanted. Think of a new house. Think of a new house. You build a new house. The architect is the one who planned the house. He is the one who tells the builder what to do, how much material to buy, how much material to use, where to put the pieces. The architect is the brains, the coordinator, and the leader in the construction. But that doesn't mean the bricklayers, the plumbers, the electricians, that doesn't mean that all of these people are unimportant. Yes, they were simply following orders, but the architect decided to use them to achieve his purpose. And it's similar with God. Yes, he ordains it all, but that does not mean those people who are part of his ordained plan doesn't mean they're unimportant, doesn't mean they're unnecessary. And the reality is this, when it comes to God's sovereignty and our responsibility, you'll never wrap your head around it. You'll never do it. You just need to accept both truths. Most heresies have come when you try to undermine one truth over the other, but the Bible simply says God's sovereign, you're responsible, deal with it. Accept the truth. Be faithful. They're not opposing truths, but they complement one another. Maybe we just can't fully grasp it in this life. Charles Spurgeon simply described these two concepts like um, the rails of a train track. They run parallel together, he said. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. They run parallel. We just can't get them together. They seem separate from each other in this life. But he says, when you look in the distance, which he says, imagine that's eternity, they simply merge together. Fourth objection, but I remember choosing God. I remember choosing God. And the reality, the reality is, you did choose Him. You did come to faith. You did place your faith in Christ. You did place your trust in Him. You did repent of your sins. You did trust in Jesus. You did all of that. Scripture commanded you to do it, and you did it. That's the only way of salvation. But what we must remember is that the only reason why you even chose God is because God chose you first. Think of a doorway. Think of a doorway. On the one side it says, repent and believe in Christ. And so you walk through the doorway. And then you turn around and you see, I chose you first. So at first it looks like you did it all with your human glasses on. But when you look in hindsight and you put God's glasses on, you see what actually happened. The reason why you even placed your faith and repented of, and repented of your sins was because God chose you. It wasn't a fleshly work of our own, but a miraculous work of God. And then one more final objection is this. If God is sovereign in our salvation, then why doesn't he save everyone? Why doesn't he save everyone? It is true that God, the scriptures say, desires all men to be saved. It's true. The scriptures say God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. It is true that God wills all mankind to be saved. But we must also remember at the same time God has two different kinds of wills. One is what we call his will of decree, what will happen no matter what. And the other one is what theologians call his will of desire. What God desires to happen. But he hasn't always ordained it. For example, God desires that there be no murder in the world. 
It's his desire. We could say that is the will of God for there to be no murder. But that does not mean God has ordained or decreed that there be no murder. So when it comes to those passages that speak of God desiring all men to be saved, we must understand those passages as referring to God's will of desire. What He desires to take place, not what He's decreed will take place. He desires people to faith because God, being good, knows what is best for man. But in His good plan... He has decided that not all will be saved. Why? Because Romans 9 verse 22 to 23 says that if there was an unregenerate people, the regenerate, the believers, if there was no unbelievers, the believers would never know what grace is, what mercy is, and what the power of God is. Mankind would never have known these attributes of God apart from God ordaining sin in this world. And there are many other questions you might have with regards to this doctrine. And if you do, I invite you to speak to Brady about them. (laughs) But I hope I've given you sufficient evidence that man is saved by grace alone. Man does not cooperate with God and his salvation because the nature of God would be in conflict with that. And the nature of man would not coincide with it either. And even the cell phone that rang is ordained by God. At this day, on this hour, that would happen. Why? Because God is sovereign. Not only in cell phones, but in our salvation. Salvation is entirely a work of God. So let us not imitate Rome in our theologies and think we have brought anything to the table. God is the Savior, not us. He is our Deliverer, not us. We are saved by His grace and not our own. Let's pray. Mighty God, we are grateful that you are a gracious God. We're grateful you're a sovereign God. You know the the end from the beginning. You've ordained the end from the beginning. I just pray that you may help us just to grasp this truth a little bit more than we did before. Sometimes certain truths are hard to swallow and we, in our flesh, we desire to rebel against the truth. I just pray you may give us humble hearts to look to your word to see how you have revealed what you do in this world, how you act. Let us not use our man-made philosophical objections to mess with the truth of God's Word. You are our sovereign God, and nothing will change that. You're the one who knows the future. You're eternal. Nothing will change that. Whether we believe in it or not, that is true. So help us to believe it, to be faithful, And preach the truth that man is saved by grace alone. And as we shall see next week, he's also saved through faith alone. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.